Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Nothing good is going to happen in your life spiritually until you recognize your absolute need for the mercy of God. When was the last time that you got alone in a quiet place, fell upon your knees, and sought God in His mercy, understanding your desperate need to be forgiven? Forgiven from what you say? From each sin, each act of disobedience, each act of pride, every little lie, big lie, whatever it is, we, if God's going to work in our life, we need to be people that have experienced God's mercy. When a person receives mercy from God, that life will be transformed. When you understand the means of that mercy. And that's what we talked about at the end of last week's study, about how Messiah, that he was going up to Jerusalem for Passover, and there he would be betrayed, he would be mocked, he would be flogged, and ultimately he would be crucified and die upon that tree. But, and this is so significant. But on the third day, and that concept, third day, speaks of victory. It speaks of the fulfillment, the fulfillment being revealed of God's purpose. And realize this, there is always a connection between the fulfillment of the purposes of God and God's glory being revealed. And when you look carefully at the Word of God concerning the moving of God's glory, when God's glory, for example, would fill the temple of God, what would happen? God. God Himself and God alone would do ministry. He would move among the people, and there would be a great outcome. But once more, it all begins with mercy. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 20. The book of Matthew and chapter 20. Now, we saw last week that, that Yeshua and his disciples, they were heading towards Jerusalem. And he was going there, as I just said, that he would fulfill the purpose by which he was sent into this world to do. And that is to give his life as a redemption for you and me. And the greatest, and I want to emphasize this, the greatest mistake that a human being can make is not to receive that redemption. Failure to receive God's redemption that comes through blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption. And if you do not receive that redemption through the blood of the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus, if you don't receive that blood, you are going to experience two things, and they're inherently related. You will experience God's eternal condemnation, His judgment. And secondly, you are going to encounter also eternally not only his judgment, but you are going to experience the shame of your sin. These two things, punishment and shame, both physically and also inwardly, God's punishment is severe. And that's why the price, the price to be forgiven, 
the means by which mercy was offered. That mercy was so precious, the blood of Messiah. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to conclude this 20th chapter and beginning with verse 29. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 29. Now, I mentioned they're on the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they come to a very specific city. That city is Jericho. That first city that the children of Israel, that they captured under the leadership of Joshua. And capturing that city, actually, God destroyed that city. And here's what's so significant. That victory opened up the land. A victory does just that. It provides us in a position where we can take possession of what? The promises of God. And that's what Messiah did. He rose on that third day. That's what we closed with last week. That third day is a day of victory. The purpose of God is completed. That's what victory is. And victory positions us in order that things open up. What things? To receive, to take hold of the promises of God. So let me ask you a question. Are you interested in God's promises? Do they motivate your life? Are they what causes you to act in obedience? That is, to demonstrate faith in a testimonial fashion, doing things that are right in God's eyes. Verse 29. And they, going forth from Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold. Now, as we talked about last week, anytime, anytime that word behold appears in the scripture, it tells us something significant is going to happen. Something that we need to pay attention to and the truth of it, the message of it, we need to apply to our life. So they're coming out of Jericho. Now, Jericho was spiritually blind. But that doesn't mean they weren't informed. What do I mean by that? Well, if you study that, that book of Joshua and you see something there concerning the men and women of Jericho, remember this woman, Rahab or Rahab? She spoke to the two spies, and she says, the fear of God has fallen upon all of us. We heard what happened at the Red Sea. We know these victories that, that you have experienced over mighty kings. They knew that. They, the fear of the Lord, was upon them. So what should they have done? They should have gone out, surrender, and said, God is with you, therefore we want to serve you. We want to be part of what you're about. But that fear, instead of producing obedience, submissiveness, it was a prideful fear, thinking and causing them to only consider themselves. And that type of fear paralyzes people and they did nothing they failed to respond and what happened they experienced destruction well they came to jericho and now the scripture says look at verse 29 they were going forth from jericho and a great crowd followed him and behold two now we know that in other gospel accounts only one is mentioned, one is emphasized, but does that does not mean that there's not two. There's nothing in conflict if there's two, and I only speak about one. Some gospels do that, emphasize one of them. But this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, emphasizes two blind men, both of them. We don't know their names as in one gospel, we know one of them. So two blind men and two shows 
two different, two conflicting opinions. And we're going to see that in a moment. Look, if you would, to this scripture. We read, two blind men are sitting on the way. Now, remember, last week, that same expression was there, on the way. It has to do with the purpose of God. And we're going to see that these two blind men, even though they were blind, they were able to perceive things spiritually. See, you can have 20-20 vision physically, but you may be spiritually blind. In fact, most of the world, perhaps. The majority of the people that are listening to me right now, that you have a problem with spiritual blindness. You're not willing to accept what the Word of God says and implement the truth of God into your life. You will regret that eternally. Make wise decisions. See, these two men, they were blind, but they could hear. And the Word of God says, faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And they had heard about this one. We'll see that in a moment. So two blind men were sitting along the way. And after hearing that, Yeshua. Now see, they had heard about Yeshua. But they were confined to Jericho. They were confined to sitting along the, the wayside, hoping for the, the charity of others. They were in, in one sense, physically, a hopeless situation. Nothing was going to change but on one day. See, this is a day for them of opportunity. A opportunity to change. And we're going to see that they were wise. At the end of this text, we're going to see their objective. Now, you may say, as the scripture is going to point out, what did they want? They wanted to see. Yes, but more than that. They wanted to see, they wanted the ministry of God in their life through Yeshua for a purpose. What purpose? We'll close with that in a few moments. So these two are sitting along the wayside. They hear after hearing that Yeshua is passing and it's in the present, meaning they have a limited opportunity. And that's usually how it is. God gives opportunity, but they don't stay around long. He was coming and literally it says he was passing by. And what did they do? They cried out. And this word is one of, of screaming, yelling. It's not simply saying, excuse me, sir, but it's yelling out in a loud way. And what were they saying? So wonderful. They said, be merciful to us, Lord, the son of David. Now, remember what I said, they may be blind physically, but they were not blind spiritually because they knew who he was. They also knew that he was the source, that he had come into this world with mercy. And that's what they desire, the mercy of God. And remember, until you are a recipient of God's mercy, nothing good from an eternal standpoint, a kingdom standpoint, a godly standpoint, is going to happen in your life. Seek God's mercy. Be a recipient of the mercy of God. Without receiving his mercy, mercy, you are in a hopeless, hopeless position. And you will remain hopeless eternally if nothing changes. So they say, be merciful to us, Lord, and then they call him. And this shows their, their understanding, their spiritual perception, perceptiveness. It says, son of David. That is, we realize that you are the Messiah. Now, if you don't come from a Jewish background, perhaps with rabbinical understanding, you may not understand son of David relating to Messiah in a unique way. You see, the concept of Messiah, Messiah brings repair. 
Now we may say restoration, but in, in Hebrew, we use that word tikkun, a repairing of things. And the only way things can be repaired is through the mercy of God. So they cry out, be merciful to me, O Lord, son of David. Verse 31. Now, remember when I said that, that there were two blind men. And the two, that number speaks about two divergent, two conflicting opinions. And we're going to see it. Because as they were doing a good thing, they were behaving with wisdom, with understanding. They knew the identity of who he is, that he's the son of David, the Messiah, that he can fix things. And that's what they wanted. But what we're going to close with is they wanted to be fixed for a purpose. But notice verse 31. But the crowd in conflict and in opposition to what these two blind men wanted. They wanted that which was right, the mercy of God. But the crowd rebuked them in order that they should be silent. That's what the world does. You begin moving towards God. You can expect, I guarantee it, there will be opposition. As you begin to think, and if you share, you know, I, I'm thinking about reading my Bible. Now, if it's a fellow believer, they'll encourage you. They'll say that's a wonderful thing to do. But if it's someone from the world, don't waste your time. That's not, that's not a, a true book. That, you'll have opposition. The world always wants to discourage, and they did so in a very intense way. Pay attention to verse 31. But the crowd, notice this, rebuked. They just didn't say, quiet down. They did so with great fervency. They rebuked them in order that they should be silent. They wanted to shut them up. And that's what the world does. Wants to shut up those things that are right according to God. Don't let the world do that. These two blind men, they may have been handicapped, but they were spiritually mature. Because all the more so, literally it's the word greater. In a greater manner, what were they doing? They were crying out. Now, if you're using a modern translation that's based upon the Nestle Allen Greek text, it will have this same identical word that we read in verse 30, where it says they screamed, they cried out, they yelled, they made quite an emotion. It's the same word, but in a different grammatical construction. The first time when it says they cried out, they yelled, it was in the simple heiress, the normal past tense. They did that. But now there's a change in the Texas Receptus. And it puts it out of the heiress into the imperfect, which means this. They were doing that, and they were doing it now, but there's going to be a change. If it's the perfect, there might not be a change. It might just continue, started in the past, now continuing, and will continue on. But the imperfect, it shows a change is coming. It stands out. And that's why I like the Texas Receptus, because it does not gloss over things. So when we look here, they were crying out, saying once more, be merciful to us, O Lord, Son of David. And here's the change that uh, the Scripture foreshadows by the imperfect tense. Verse 32. And Yeshua stood, and he called them. Now imagine this. What it's saying here is that these two men in their, and don't miss this, in their perseverance, being persistent, not succumbing to the advice, what I would call worldly propaganda. Instead of giving heed to that and saying, all right, we'll, we'll quiet down, we won't do something, they all the more so, with greater power, they cried out. And it was that persistentness that, that, that impacted Yeshua to the extent that he stood, he stopped, and he called them and he said, 
What do you want that I should do for you? And they were saying to him, notice this next word. It's the third time that the word kurios, Lord, appears here. Three times. And this is to reveal the number three, three occurrences to reveal something. They saw him not just as the fixer, someone who could solve their problems, put them in the situation or in the location they wanted to be in, but they saw him as Lord. Now, you may say, yes, I'm in need of God's mercy. But do you realize that the only one, and I want to say that again, do you realize that the only one that can supply to you, and he does so freely, he pays everything, the only one that can give you the grace of God is the Lord. And when you receive that mercy, you are receiving that from the Lord of your life. And that fact has serious implications. Now, it has eternal implications. That's wonderful. Eternal life, kingdom life, the promises of God. But in this world, the implication is that we are called to follow him. When you say, God, I want to be a recipient of your mercy, the motivation for that request is not I just don't like my life. I've got problems, solve them for me. And if I have any more problems, I'll come back to you. That is not faith. That is a a Christian manifestation of idolatry. It's just that. You can use the name Jesus, you can have biblical terminology, but in essence, it resembles idolatry because you are the center of your religious experience. It's what you want. That's not what these men wanted. They were very different. And I'll prove it to you. Let's just keep reading. It says, Lord, that our eyes, and here's another important thing, that our eyes should be open. Now, once more, if you're using a modern translation from the Nestle Allen edition of the Greek text, it's just that our eyes would open. Just, it would happen. But the better Greek text puts us in the passive. Why is that important? It's not going to happen on its own. You can want something, but that want isn't going to change it. It's only the Lord. See, they recognize he's Lord. And with God, all things are possible. So if they were going to see, if their eyes were going to be opened up, it was going to be done. It just doesn't happen. Something has to cause it, and he's the cause. So they say, Lord, that our eyes would be open up. And it was because of their recognition of who he was, is, and his authority. Notice verse, verse 34 at the end. But Yeshua, having been moved with compassion, meaning this. This is also in the passive, something triggered him to behave with compassion. For him to look favorably. See, there were many blind people, many people in need. But he was moved by compassion because of their understanding. Their spiritual wisdom and understanding how things happen with God. So look at verse 34. But having been moved with compassion, that is Yeshua, he touched their eyes and, and I like this, and immediately. See, with God, when everything's right, and what do I mean by that, everything's right? Well, in this world, there are laws. There's order. And if you violate the order of something, you're not going to get the right outcome. The result's not going to happen. Same thing with spiritual laws. And when we do obey, implement spiritual truth following the laws that God has set up, when we act in faith, seeking his mercy for the right objective, 
when these things are met, God is going to move in our life. And this is exactly what happens here. Being moved with compassion, Yeshua does what? He touched their eyes and immediately, no delay, immediately their eyes saw. Their eyes regained their sight. And isn't it interesting? This word for regaining sight, it's not just the word blepo, which means I see. But it's word anablepo, which means this, I see upwards. When, when he gave them, restored their sight. The implication is they saw things from upward, meaning they saw things from a biblical, a heavenly perspective. And they had great vision. Not just a physical 2020 vision, but they had spiritual insight. And that's why, notice what they do, end of our, our chapter, end of verse 34. What did they do with this, this new regained vision, this ability to, to see? What does the scripture says? And. And this is a conjunction. It unites everything, this whole story, all that's happened. It unites it with their primary objective. And what was that? Well, what did they do? It says, and their eyes saw upward, literally, they regained their sight, and they followed him. That's that spiritual wisdom. They wanted mercy. They wanted God to work in their life, to work a miracle, to restore things back to the purposes of God, how God created man to be. Why? In order that they could serve to follow after the Son of God. So let me ask you, are you someone that wants God's mercy? I hope you are. I hope you realize your absolute need for that because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But why do you want His mercy? Just to be forgiven so you don't have eternal punishment? That's one truth. But maturity not only wants to not experience the wrath of God, but spiritual maturity wants to follow after Yeshua. And it's following after him that you're going to find the joy, the purpose, the contentment in your life. So follow him. Don't be spiritually blind. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.